Hello, this is a brave non guide about arena formations. This guide will cover the general idea on what makes a good formation, as well as more specifics such as formation theory and mercenary positioning. I'll first be going over an important detail you should know before you consider climbing the arena. The most important detail to climb high in any of the arena formats is nearly all of your mercenaries must be at least skill level plus 15, and your mythic skill levels should be all be rank A or higher. The reason being is that most meta mercenaries receive their biggest power spike at skill level plus 15. For example, Velfin gets a massive AoE increase, while Lucius can take 28 more instances of damage before dying. And it's not just Legends, Agni at plus 15 has her AoE increased, Haruna at plus 15 has her provisional HP doubled, Delsahine at plus 15 has her guard aura go from 75% to 99.9%, .9%, and the list goes on. Of course I'm just cherry picking the most insane ones, but not having most of your mercenaries at plus 15 puts you at risk of being stat checked by your enemies. What's the point in running a mercenary if they cannot counter what they're meant to counter, or cannot perform how they're meant to perform? Now, not all mercenaries have to be at plus 15, some work at plus 12 or even lower in some rare cases, but to climb to the very top of the arena, skill level plus 15 is not optional, it's a requirement. Due to the abstractness of making arena formations, it'll be better to first understand the general ideas you should have in your mind while making a formation. Number 1. Build your team around a concept. I'll delve more deeply into this topic later in the video, but in short, focusing your team around a concept gives you a better sense of direction on what mercenaries you need. Number 2. Have a good opener. Since you go first in all of the arena formats, you have to make sure that you utilize this advantage by having a strong opener. Let me repeat and enhance a very good analogy from GC Yoshi. <clears throat> Imagine you're playing chess and your first move is to fly your queen to the other side of the map and take out the bishop, knight, rook, two pawns, and check their king. Crazy, right? That's how borderline overpowered going first is in Brave 9. Abuse it. Number 3. Don't forget about defense. Having a strong offense is important, sure, but being able to withstand the enemy's retaliation is just as important. It can be impossible to end the fight if your main attackers get picked off. Number 4. Positioning. Just like the first point, I'll delve more deeply into this topic later in the video as it cannot be simply explained in a few sentences. And lastly, number 5, Spell Cards. Spell Cards are powerful items that aid you in battle by allowing you to cover weaknesses in your formation that would otherwise be impossible. Spell Cards is a whole nother can of worms to talk about, so I'll just make another video about it later. It'll be linked in the description if it's done. And that's it. Those are the 5 points you should keep in mind while making an arena formation. Though, just as I promised, I'll delve deeper into the first point and third point. I'll start with the first point. To elaborate on my first point, building your team around a concept, it'll be much easier if I first explain what I believe are the real mercenary categories. Number 1. True Slayers True Slayers are the main fighters in your team. If they get one good attack off, you are most likely to win the fight. These mercenaries sport high damage, great type coverage, often large AoE, and are difficult to defend against. Protect your Slayers well, as the only weakness they hold is extreme fragility, a slight breeze is enough to send them to the afterlife. Examples include Islok, Lakshmi, Enma, and Velfern. 2. Utility Slayers Utility Slayers are mercenaries that lack the extreme kill power a true Slayer has, but makes up for it with their, you know, utility. Note that Utility Slayers are not the main win condition. Their kill power is not enough to consistently make a significant impact. So instead, their main function is to provide some sort of utility, and on the side they deal damage. Examples include Larkus, Kaim, Scrime, Wilhelma, Haruna, and Claudia. 3. Roadblock Tanks Roadblock Tanks are extremely durable mercenaries that are made to consistently absorb the enemy's attacks. However, at the cost of their insane tank potential, a taunt isn't naturally built into their skill kit, which makes positioning them incredibly important to maximize their usefulness. The purpose of roadblock tanks is to waste enemy turns, mainly to prevent the enemy team from killing your own slayers. Examples include Lucius, Arkin, and Ymir. 4. Taunt Tanks Taunt tanks are mercenaries that are much more volatile than roadblockers, but do have a taunt built into their skill kit. A taunt tank's main purpose is to draw fire away from your team, so place them quite literally far far away from your slayers. They cannot waste as many enemy turns like a roadblocker can, but they can still waste enough to be problematic for the enemy. Remember, it's always worth trading your taunter to avoid getting your slayers killed. Examples include Ser, Letacrad, and Benshima. 5. Bait Supports Bait Supports are supporters that don't really matter if they die. They are mainly used to get their unconditional but mediocre buffs off so that your team doesn't hit like a wet noodle. Then afterwards they are used as meat shields. Examples of Bait Supports include Beliath, Endolin, Ida with Authority of Goddess, and Refethithi- Refethithi- Ref, 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 if, if, yeah. Eh, close enough. 6. Core Supports Core Supports are the supporters that you base your entire team around, and what I mean about building your team around a concept. These mercenaries support the most powerful yet highly conditional buffs in the game, and it's your responsibility to meet those conditions or take advantage of them. It's necessary that every team has at least one core supporter, or at maximum two. 
Examples of core supports include Delsahine, Mary, Ida with Noble Sacrifice, Indra, and Mary White. Here is just a brief list of some mercenaries that fall under the six categories I've just mentioned. I didn't put all the mercenaries because I don't have enough space, so instead I just put the most common ones you'll see in today's meta. Before I go ahead and spill out lots of information, I should mention that I'm talking purely from the classic arena standpoint, as the team building in World Arena and especially Novice Arena gets kinda hazy and is far less stringent. Alright? Okay, let's begin. When making an arena team, it should follow the general guidelines of having one or at maximum two core supports that you revolve your entire team around, one or at maximum two bait supports to increase the damage of your team or to use for some other utility, a number of slayers that suit your needs, 1-2 to two being defensive and stall reliant, 4-5 to five being aggressive and kill reliant, or 3 being the best of both worlds. And lastly, fill the rest of your team slot with roadblockers or taunters that suit your need. To give you a better understanding, I'll go through the process of making a team myself. So, before even thinking about placing any of my mercenaries down, I need to know what core supporter I want to build my team around. Currently, as the making of this video, the best core supports in the game are Delsahine, Ida with Noble Sacrifice, Mary White, and Indra. In this team, I'm going to select Indra because I like using mages, but also because... <laughs> now, onto the bait supports. I'm going to select Ida with Authority of Goddess because of her ability to both roadblock and buff my allies. I'm also selecting Refi because of her near team-wide buff, in addition to her utility of countering mercenaries with immortality buffs. Next, onto the Slayers. I'm going for three Slayers because I want the best of both worlds in offense and defense. Thus, the Slayers I'm going to choose are Velfern, Anubis, and Freyla. Velfern and Anubis as my true slayers, and Freyla as my utility slayer. And lastly, I now have to fill in the rest of my team with tanks that suit my needs. With only 3 slots left, I'm going to choose a mixture of both roadblockers and taunters. For my roadblock tank, I'm going to pick Lucius for his ability to block a comical amount of damage. And for taunters, I'm picking Sarah for a reliable taunt and surprisingly solid tanking capability. And I'm also picking Benshima for his situational taunt just in case Sarah dies. And there we go. Team formation done! Well, not really. This team has some solid mercenaries, but what it lacks now is proper positioning. I very much obviously made the positioning bad on purpose to make a point, but positioning is still quite an important factor to consider when making your formation, which leads into my next point. If you are just starting out, I recommend you to keep to the general rule that you have one DPS lane and one stall lane. A DPS lane is where all your slayers and core supports are positioned, while a stall lane is where all your tanks are positioned. This formation is called a line formation, and the reason why I recommend this formation to new players is because it's simple, easy to make, and very effective. It's effective because it allows you to concentrate your slayer's damage into a single lane, enabling them to snowball the fight very easily, in addition to giving your roadblock tanks more attacks to block as attacks will quite literally funnel into them. I should mention that you don't have to be so stringent with your DPS lane being at top lane and your stalling always being at the bottom lane. It's totally fine to run a DPS mid lane or even a DPS bot lane, provided that, you know, they're well protected. Actually, it might even be beneficial to not go a DPS top lane yourself, because if you see a lot of opponents going DPS top lane, you can be a bit sneaky and position your DPS in bot lane, since your attacks will naturally flow into the enemy's top lane without risk of being attacked back. It's kind of like a game of rock, paper, scissors in that regard. Top lane beats mid lane, mid lane beats bot lane, and bot lane beats top lane. And let me remind you that both your DPS and stalling doesn't strictly have to be in a single lane. There's flexibility, and it's totally alright to spread your mercenaries a bit. Don't forget that I'm just recommending the line formation for newer players due to its simplicity and effectiveness. If you're confident and want to make a more spread out formation, then go for it. And don't worry if you don't get the positioning right. It's a skill that you fine tune over time by making formations over and over. And honestly, even when finishing your formation, you still can't be 100% sure it's perfect unless you go into the arena yourself and see how it does. That's the best way to see your team's performance. And from there, you can clearly see the tweaks you need to make. Additionally, I should also mention that you could never NEVER get a 100% win rate on any formation you make. No matter how unbeatable you think it is, there will always be another formation out there that will beat your formation. So don't expect to go to the arena and win every single fight, but at the same time, don't get discouraged if your team is defeated in the very first fight, as it might have just been an unlucky matchup. A more effective measure of how well your team is doing is to look at its attack win rate. There's a neat little button over here which shows your attack win rate, like, right here. For a general guideline, 91% or higher means that you are currently not in the right arena ranking. You are winning because your opponents just started the game and don't have the right mercenaries. 80% to 90% means that your team is performing insanely well. No changes are needed or very minor positioning tweaks at most. 70 to 80% means that your team is performing pretty good. Maybe do some positioning or turnover tweaks if you feel that it's necessary. 60 to 70% means that your team is performing not bad, but can definitely be better. Consider changing the mercenaries and or change up your positioning. 59% or less means that your team is performing poorly. You should rework your team entirely as there are glaring issues that need to be fixed.
Spell cards are powerful items that you attach to your team. And in battle, once a spell card's turn has arrived, its effect will happen. Each spell card is a unique effect, and most of them are strong. So therefore, these items are critical in the arena in order to boost your team's slaying power, or to protect your team from dying too fast. However, just as I said earlier in the video, I won't go over the spell cards because each of them differ from one another so much that they deserve their own video entirely. Just know that spell cards are extremely powerful and are a must-have in your arena formations. Before I end this video, let me go over the general ideas of an arena formation again to summarize everything you've learned. 1. Building a team around a core supporter is the best way to go about making a team. 2. Abuse the advantage of going first in arena by having a strong opener. 3. Don't forego defense because the enemy can still fight back. 4. Position your mercenaries well. And 5. Equip spell cards that suit your team's needs. And that's all. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll try my best to answer them. Thanks for watching.